Shadow of the Earth Tree is on its way. And one of the first questions I asked myself after reading all of the articles about it was how fast I'll be able to get to it. How long will it take me to get from character creation to the new content of the expansion? So in this video, I'll briefly talk you through my first thoughts about how to do this, then tell you why it might not be ideal, show you a full run of the game based on a much better idea, then at the end, talk about some of the things you could do with this approach. To enter the Land of Shadow, there are two requirements. Killing Radan, for reasons I don't think we're certain of currently, and killing Moog to get to the Withered Arm. So how fast can you reasonably get to the DLC, even if you're not a Souls God? Well, I'd already had my initial theory on this, so I thought I'd see how it worked in practice. I started a new game as the Bandit. The setup I did for this test was a shortened version of my standard setup guide, where I went only for the Sombers and Flask upgrades, and grabbed stuff on the way rather than all at the start. You don't need to remember or follow any of this, by the way. This is proof of concept rather than the actual guide for this. In Limgrave, I went to the High Road Cave for the Blue Dancer Charm. Then ganked Neregis with Eura for the Reduvia. After cheesing the Knight's Cavalry and killing Grail and Caelid, I put all of my runes into my Vigor, as we're going to need it for fighting Moog early. Margit and Godric are a joke. The Reduvia isn't absolutely melting them at base damage stats, but with 44 Vigor, you can take an absolute beating and still come out on top. Now straight to Noble in Volcano Manor. Noble is the only boss that isn't required here, but I think it's worth it for that plus 9 upgrade. Again, the damage isn't ludicrous, but as we don't need any blue flasks at all, we've got a very muscular health bar and 9 heals, so we're tough to kill. Grab the Somber 7 on the balcony and pump up that arcane stat a little. Now to Kaelid for the big man. Despite almost not leveling your damage stats up at all, the Reduvia being at plus 9 combined with it being the Reduvia means that Radan is pretty much a scripted fight. And once again, we've got tons of health so we can take a beating. To the walking mausoleum to dupe the remembrance, pump the damage some more, then complete Vare's questline to access Mogwin's palace. Grab a somber 10 from outside the boss room to take the Reduvia to Max and head into Moog. And I was pleasantly surprised here. I thought this fight would be a lot worse at this level, but it's fine. You need a relatively good grasp of Moog's moveset, so it's not for beginners, but it really isn't that bad at all. If you've seen any of these videos of mine, you're probably thinking, what about that Moog cheese? And yes, that cheese still works on current patch but I'm working on the assumption that From Software will patch that before the DLC. It's not a very well-known glitch, but I'd imagine they'll be looking into Moog cheeses because he's such an important part of getting there. If they don't, we won't have to buy Moog. So my routing on this test run wasn't completely perfect. There was a little bit of dithering here and there as I was making it up as I went along, but shockingly, no deaths. And I managed to beat Moog reaching the requirements to access Shadow of the Earth Tree an hour and 46 minutes after starting the game. I have a plus 10 Reduvia, and with Moog's runes, I'm at level 73. Level 73 is probably a little low for the DLC, but because I'm a bandit and already have a bow and arrow, I could easily just cheese the bird off the cliff in Mogwin's Palace to farm runes to up my level before heading into the expansion. If you want to do a playthrough where you grab a new fancy weapon from the DLC and take it back to the base game, so you can Porcupine Hippo Melania, or kick the living shit out of Gideon, something I'm personally very excited about, this might be the way to do it. 
as it's doable without requiring godly skills and leaves the base game almost untouched. However, we can't level up another weapon as we can't get another plus seven somber until after Morgoth. If you wanted to use a smithing weapon, we could only get to a maximum of plus 16 here. We don't have access to half of the base game, so we're limited in weapons, spells and armor we can use. And most importantly, I fucking hate farming. So the question is, what else could you do relatively easily in an hour and 46 minutes? Hey guys, Thingfishy here, and welcome to my first speed build. We're going to complete the main game in well under two hours, and that includes some very slow fights and a few deaths, so I think you could probably get this closer to 120, 125 if all went well. This run is somewhere between one of my standard build guides and an any percent speed run of Elden Ring. But where speed runs are rooted to be fast at all costs, I've rooted this one in a way that makes it a lot more forgiving, as well as avoiding any of the harder skips and glitches. I'm going to talk you through the whole game from character creation to credits, and you can follow along with the full run on my new second channel. I wanted to start a second channel so I can post nerdy Shadow of the Earth Tree stuff without worrying about the algorithm too much. I may upload some full runs like this one, and it may also be the home of the DLC parry guides so give it a sub if that sounds good. We start this run as the Samurai class, although any of the other melee classes will work fine for this run. And unusually, you want to grab the lands between rune rather than the golden seed as the starting item. Pop this on the lift on your way up to Limgrave, and when you get to Kale at the third church, you're gonna buy the crackpot, crafting kit, and a torch. Head to the gate front grace, speak to Melina, and grab Torrin. Then we need two things from the gate front camp. First the flail, this will be important later and can be found in the carriage to the southeast of the camp. Quit out, walk back to the grace, then go grab the whetstone knife from the cellar. Now ride up towards the storm hill grace. Light it, then ride southeast past the hut and drop down to grab a lone smithing stone on this chair in the field. Back to the grace and northeast for the strength tier, then dropping down the platforms behind it. Ride east from here to bully the Golden Val Knight for the Ash of War. Then drop down onto these ruins into the camp. Grab the lance in case we want to fight Rykard later, but the important bit here is the exalted flesh. Northeast out of the camp to see our old chum. Help him out of the hole, then convince him to give you his shard. Light the Saints Bridge bonfire, then jump off the side, ride north, to head into the High Road Cave for the Blue Dancer charm. Then back to the Saints Bridge, and across it, grabbing this smithing stone on the way. Then at the Merchant, by the short sword, crack pot, and all the smithing stones. From here, head southeast towards these ruins. In between, you'll find some mushrooms and St. Trina's lilies we'll need for later. Then down the cliff to loot the cookbook and a golden rune fall. Drop down the cliff and ride towards the third church. Grab the Physic and Sacred Tear, then ride south to the Minor Earth Tree for the Spike Crack Tear, then southwest to the Misswood Ruins for the Axe Talisman. 
grab the St. Trina's lilies here on the way in while the bear is asleep. For some reason, I chose this moment to try getting them after exiting, which was pretty dumb. Head south to Fort Height. Grab the golden seed outside, then up to the top for the first half of the medallion. Now back to the third church and into the river to the teleporter. Ride south from the bestial sanctum, grabbing the golden seed on the way. Now at this point, the sensible thing to do is grab that bonfire at the bridge. But if you're being speedy and you're confident with cavalry, don't bother. Follow this route to jump down the branches. Jump onto the side of the bridge and run to our standard quit out spot by the break in the wall. Sometimes you can get lucky and he'll jump straight at you as you're running towards this. Up the spirit spring behind the rise and grab these runes from the coffins. Then pass the minor earth tree behind it and up another spirit spring to Fort Farrah for the second half of the medallion and Radagon's sword seal. Now we're not killing Grail in this run. This is a choice I obviously made for speed, but whether you do or don't depends how confident you are with the game in general, and in particular how confident you are with cheesing the Knight's Cavalry. Killing Grail only adds on a few minutes, so if it often takes you longer than that to kill Cavalry, or you just like extra levels, kill Grail instead or in addition to Cavalry. From Fort Farrath, southwest to the Spirit Spring and down it towards the Church of the Plague through the church, and now we need to skyrim ourselves down these cliffs. I'll let this play so you can see the exact route I use. Now we're heading to the Grace by Redmain Castle. Light the bonfire by the bridge and follow this route to use something I've never used in this game before, the Cragblade Ash of War. Time for Margit. At the Grace, level up your flasks and allocate three blue ones. For your Physic, we want the Spike Crack tier and the Strength tier. Equip Golden Vow to your short sword, then take off all of your clothes. Unequip the torch and equip the Blue Dancer Charm. Now even though we have a plus zero Uchi and our strength levels aren't really helping here, Margit is a completely scripted fight apart from the last two hits with this weapon. You could use exactly the same strat with Square Off on the Confessor or Vagabond classes. Run through Stormvale, dodging all of the arrows perfectly. Ah! Yep, that was one of the deaths. Who could have predicted that? When you're running through the courtyard, head right to grab these mushrooms by the stairs. Now for Godric, and it's basically unsheathed for the win. Not the bullying fest that it usually is, but Unsheath and Square Off will keep you out of trouble here, on whatever class you start with. Through the castle behind Godric and Liania. This is where we do pretty much all of the setup for this run. You could actually do this before Margit and Godric if you want to make those fights a little easier. So after grabbing the sacred tier at the Church of Irith, head down to the merchant by the lake and pop a rune before you get there. We want all of his smithing stones. Then north 
to the Lascar ruins. Grab these smithings by the gazebo and head into the teleporter. From the academy gate back down towards the entrance. It's only in re-watching this footage that I realised I never grabbed this smithing 3. It's not the end of the world but this will save you a couple of thousand runes later. Follow this route to drop down by the crab for more smithing stones. Then around the corner for the golden seed. Across the roof of this building and southeast to the gate town grace. There's a couple of routes we need to do from here. From the grace, head for this rock sticking up in the distance to reach some smithing threes. Then northwest from here to the poison gazebo for more. Finally, head towards the academy to find this one with a teleporter to the King's Realm ruins. Through the ruins, light the grace next to EG for later. Now back to the Gate Town Grace for another route. Ride southwest across the lake to get to the Ball Prawn Shack. Light the grace here, and from it you should see our next stop, the gazebo by the lobsters. Grab the smithing stones here and jump out the back to quit out to avoid getting sniped. For our last stones, back to the academy gate, jump off the side onto this rock and to the gazebo to the west. Now back to the ball prawn shack for our weapon. Equip Radagon's saw seal to meet the flail's requirements. Buff with Golden Vow, then pin Bogart in the corner with the Ash of War. This is completely safe with the flail. Now warp to EG, pop Godric's Remembrance, and level the balls up to plus eight. Our next stop is the Grand Lift of Dectus. The only thing we need to grab on the way is the Sacred Tear in the Bellum Church. At some point along the route, swap your talismans over to the blue dancer and axe. When you reach Altus, head straight for the Altus Plateau Grace. From there, northwest to the Lux Ruins, taking off your armour to activate the blue dancer charm on your way. Buff up outside the arena, then bully the demi human queen to grab the ritual sword talisman. Back to the Grace, and our next stop is the Grace behind the two Tree Sentinels, so across Altus and up the stairs. Grab the Golden Seeds, then northeast towards the Sealed Tunnel. When you get there, follow this little route for some Smithing Stones and the Bell Bearing too. Back to the round table to buy 11 smithing threes and 12 smithing fours. The next step in this route is either the Draconic Sentinel or Radan. Both will one shot you at this vigor level, but whichever one you fight second won't be able to one shot you. So I went for the Draconic Sentinel as he's much easier to stun lock than Radan. And this is about as bad a fight as you can get with this build. This was actually a theme of this run. When I did a test run to figure out the route and levels, every boss was basically done in 20 seconds. Then when I recorded it, it all went to shit. But as you're seeing the worst case scenario here, you'll probably have a much easier time. Pump all of the runes into your vigor. 
Now for Radan, who is almost certainly the toughest fight on this run, and this was another death for me. But as long as you're careful, you can get a scripted fight and even a phase one kill if it goes perfectly. Now through lane down, on the way, quit out to deload the imps. Then bully the tree avatar for the Lord's room. Before Godfrey, head back to the round table to grab the third talisman slot from Enya. For the Godfrey fight, R1s and jumping R2s for the safe approach, or charges if you know the moveset well. Now Morgoth. I actually practiced this fight a bunch on my test run, and almost every time I was getting incredibly quick fights by staggering him out with that dagger attack, then bullying phase 2 with Golden Val still active. Of course though, on the actual run, he jumped all over the place like Tigger and wouldn't let me hit him. But even in this worst case scenario, as soon as he stops moving, the fight is over very quickly. Our next stop from here is in the mountain tops at the Zamor Ruins. Follow this route for the Smithing Bell 3, then back to the round table for a plus 18. Ride all the way to Fire Giant's Grace, then double back on yourself to grab the ancient smithing stone from the giant skull. So in most speedrun routes for Elden Ring, you would grab Flame Grant Me Strength, as well as Golden Vow. Indeed, that's what I usually do for this kind of strength build. This makes all of the bosses far easier to kill. But getting those extra faith stats is going to cost you a bunch of levels in Vigor. And my big fiery assistant will now help me explain why I didn't go for that approach. If the Ritual Sword was active here, this would have been a phase one without him rolling away. In phase two, buff as soon as the cutscene ends. Miss your first attack because you suck at video games, then proceed to bully him anyway. Run through Farum all the way to the Dragon Temple Transept Grace. Now we're going to nip back to the secluded cell in Stormvale, and into the room opposite, 
to grab extra crack pots for safety. We have everything we need for six sleep pots, but I'd advise you make a save file here in case anything goes wrong. Run into Duo's arena and heal instead of chucking a sleep pot at them. Eventually figure it out and hit them with charges and reposts. Because of Noble's blunt resistance, you will have to dodge his phase transition. But apart from that, this is a very safe fight. Back to the round table to buy 12 smithing 7s and 12 smithing 8s to reach max level on the balls. Run through the rest of the duck. Run through the rest of the dungeon as quickly as you can. If I'm going for maximum safety, I'll usually quit out here on this bird section. Sprint straight past the Draconic Sentinel and quit out so you can buff up for Malaketh. Now the theme for both Malaketh and Godfrey is just take your time. It's quicker to take your time and live than rush and die. Don't worry about Golden Val running out, the balls are good enough without it. The safest punish for Beast is that slow dragging sweep for charged attacks, but you can also get stuck in with jump attacks and R1s in between. Again, on the test run, I staggered Malaketh at the start and killed him in 10 seconds. But the balls can miss if you're not careful, which is exactly what happened here. But again, here is where those vigor levels save us. For Gideon, after your normal buffing, pop the Exalted Flesh we picked up right at the start. Three charges will kill him, but if the third one misses, one on one will finish him off. Since we've hit the soft cap for our strength, I started piling on the Endurance from here so I could bully Elden Beast, but feel free to go for Vigor instead if you're not confident with Godfrey, the rest of them are scripted. Treat Godfrey the same as the Shade, R1s and Quick Attacks for safety, or Charges if you know the moveset well. Horalu is completely scripted no matter what, hit him after that first attack and he'll go into the Stomp. Dodge the Stomp, a single R1 dodge the second slam, and the fight's over. For Radagon, brute force three charged attacks at the start and tank the stomp. Dodge the jumping attack, and the fight's over. And for Elden Beast, just spam charged attacks. So, a pretty scuffed run, but the base game is done, we have almost every area open, we can easily get any somber or smithing weapon to max by going to get the bell bearings. We have Elden Beast's Remembrance, so we can do the less tedious farm in Mogwin's Palace for super quick level ups if we want them. I haven't mentioned Moog yet, but get to him either through the snowfields or through Vare's questline. 
and this build is so good for him that he is dead before knee hill every time. So we have the whole game unlocked and a build strong enough to get any other items, weapon and armor we could want for the DLC very easily. To prove it, I made a save file at this point and messed around a bit. First I went and grabbed the Nagakiba, then leveled it and my Uchi up, respect everything to Dex, which our samurai starting class is perfect for, and voila, a ferocious Dex build. Regular viewers may also be thinking of that samurai faith build I made a few weeks back. If you grab the red hot wet blade and respect to pure faith, you have a monstrous faith build that's just as good with incantations as it is with melee. I reloaded, then went and grabbed the Giant Crusher, used Radabeast runes to level it, and without any further adjustments, we have the bestest bonk, and we're ready to head into the DLC. And yes, this is a strength build on a Samurai starting class, but with a quick respect to in and a quick blast through Rani's questline, here I am bullying Melania with the Moonlight Greatsword and Karian Regal Scepter. This isn't without compromises, no. While it's super convenient time-wise, this idea is not perfect. For pure in and faith builds, starting with a melee class and rushing the game will put you at a disadvantage in terms of either damage or vigor. But for making a PvE DLC build, farm some extra runes for your vigor and you're good to go. For an int build specifically, you would be locked out of the Magic Scorpion charm. I did try to think of other important items you'd be locked out of by rushing the game like this. And while there are many specific items and weapons, the Magic Scorpion charm was the only massive general loss I could think of, as pretty much all of the other questlines can be completed after the story. I am going to do some testing to see if I can come up with foolproof int and faith versions of this run but I suspect that they'll be more skill based than this one is. But as a worst case scenario for creating DLC builds in the time most of my runs take to set up, I don't think this is bad at all. So for now, that's it. The fastest foolproof method I can think of for making DLC characters. If you try this run, please let me know how it goes in the comments. As always, thanks for watching. See you soon.